have you here, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. David Goodman because he always gives an excellent workshop. And that's because he's been teaching horology for many years. Yeah. He does a great job at it, and it shows. Oh, David? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I came here today to talk to you about count wheel striking. And in fact, count wheel striking mostly in American count wheel striking clocks. Why would I do that? Well, I'll tell you, for the, for the almost 20 years that I've been teaching people about clocks, how, how they work, and how to understand them, I've learned that the part that needs the most understanding is the striking mechanism. And probably a few of you may agree with me. So what I plan to do is to show you on this, uh, on this movable sketch, I plan to show you how count wheel striking works in American clocks in its simplest form and with its principal variations. Those are important. And why it works in that seemingly complicated two-step process called the warning. We all know what the warning does. Every no, everybody knows what the warning does. But I want to show you why the warning is necessary in most of the clocks we see. And I'm not sure that everybody knows why the warning is necessary. And then I'm going to show you, uh, it, I'm going to show you how to locate the parts in every clock that you will see. Even if, especially if it's a clock you've never seen before, there's a very simple way to locate the parts in striking. And that's one of the things that I will be uh, showing you how to do. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you've taken the clock apart and put it back together, you've repaired it, cleaned it, whatever, the setup, how to put the striking mechanism back together again so it'll work properly. There are five critical relationships that must be complied with when you reassemble a striking mechanism if it's to work as it did before. And if it isn't working, I will show you how to understand where the trouble is coming from, and as we go along, provide some sort of uh, uh, some insight, perhaps, as to how to live with those damn wires, you know, that always manage to get out of adjustment as you go along. And uh, that, that's what I plan to show you. And then, for those of you who are still awake, I brought a clock in that is completely different from the striking mechanism that I will be talking about. And, but this clock, being completely different, has some components. It performs certain functions which fill the gap when I talk about count wheel striking mechanism. It, it sort of completes the picture of count wheel striking, and, and in spite of the fact that it's very interesting in other regards, it also has functions which you will not see in count wheel striking, but as I say, it fills, it fills the gap. OK, that's what I plan to do. And I'm going to start where I always do when I talk about clocks. You know, let me get uh, something over here out on the table there. When I talk about clocks, I always start with the, the, the quick sketch of the mechanical clock. This is the quick sketch of every mechanical clock that you will ever see. Let me, let me explain. When I talk about clocks and I say every clock, what I really mean is uh, uh, most of the time except for the exceptions. But if I say every, every, that means absolutely all the time except for the exceptions. And occasionally I'll get carried away, I'll say every, 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 that means there are no exceptions that I'm aware of or that I can think of at the moment, but you can bet 
the out there. So, let me show you the quick sketch of the mechanical clock with special emphasis on the four principal components, the function of the four, uh, and the functions of the parts. Let me get this straightened out so that I tell you things in the proper sequence, because uh, that's extremely important. Yeah, here we are. Okay. Every mechanical clock consists of four principal components, and with special emphasis on the function of, the, of those components and function of the parts, those four components are, number one, self-contained source of power, a spring or a weight, and a train of wheels, last one of which has equally spaced pointed teeth at the escape wheel. Functional parts, the source of power, its job is to keep that escape wheel turning. Of course, you might say that its job is to keep the pendulum swinging, but that won't help you if, if something goes wrong and you, and you want to look for where the trouble is. If that escape wheel is not turning, this is where your trouble is coming from, from this direction. Never mind about this eventually having to keep the pendulum swinging. So that's its job, the source of power, to keep this escape wheel turning. The train of wheels in this part of the clock may be the least important because all it does really is to determine how long the clock shall run between windings. Very little else than that in this part of the clock. But uh, there is something about a train of wheels in the clock like this that's enormously important when we speak about the striking mechanism, and it's this, that a train of wheels acts as a transformer for speed. When you go up the train, the wheels turn faster and faster but with proportionally diminished turning force. I'll mention that again, because when we get the count wheel striking, that's very important. And the reason for my doing this is to point out a couple of, couple of points, make a couple of points to keep in mind when we get to that movable sketch. One of them being the function of a train of wheels acting as a step-up transformer for speed. Okay, that's part number one. Part number one in every mechanical clock Part, excuse me, part number two in every mechanical clock is the escapement. And it always consists of two parts, the escape wheel and the oscillating metal device, the ends of which project in between the teeth and keep the teeth from turning, except as that device oscillates, allowing one tooth at a time to escape. Those are the pallets, and uh, that's its function. It keeps the escape wheel from turning, except as it oscillates. Function of the escape wheel, very important, very often overlooked. It's the escape wheel that causes the pallets to oscillate pushing them by pushing them out of the way. That's its job. It pushes the pallets out of the way. And the function of the escapement as a whole is by way of the physical extension of the pallets to keep the pendulum, to, yes, to keep the pendulum swinging, or if it's a balance wheel and balance wheel, balance spring clock, to keep the balance wheel and balance spring oscillating. That's the job of the escapement. We'll stick with the pendulum, though. That's the third component of every clock. The third component is, in this case, the pendulum. It is the controller of the clock. It's the controller of the escapement. It controls the rate at which the escapement can operate. So the escapement keeps the pendulum swinging. The pendulum controls the rate at which the escapement can operate. Okay, that's three parts. What's the fourth component of every clock? Everything else that's connected with the clock. And usually consists of at least a dial and two hands. Sometimes not even that. There are clocks that don't have a dial in two hands. But very often, a great deal more. All those magical, astronomical indications, that's what the fourth component is, the indications of the clock, what the clock, what the clock tells you, what the clock does for you. Magical. The most, don't let it get around the most interesting part of every clock are the indications. Not many, oh, I'm not going to get into the area of discussing clocks against watches. I think 
You understand the point I was about to make. I won't do it. However, among those magical in uh, indications in the fourth component of every clock, of course, is striking and chiming. And the one that I'll be talking about is striking and chiming mechanism. And uh, as I said at the beginning, in the time that I've been teaching, I have learned that the most thing, that, that the, the part that needs the most understanding in clock is the striking mechanism. And most of the clocks we see are American clocks. And striking mechanism in American clock, clocks is almost always count wheel striking. But that's not all. Count wheel controls chiming mechanisms in clocks. And if you have a chiming mechanism in a clock that has automatic resynchronization, you've got a double count wheel striking. You have a double count wheel operation back to back. That's how automatic resynchronization takes place in chiming clocks. So you see, the, the, the count wheel striking is with us a great deal more than you might imagine. And in fact, if there's anything that I've learned in the 20 years, almost 20 years that I've been teaching, about understanding all clocks, after all, that's, that's, my, that's my idea, that's my aim, not just understanding American clocks or count wheel striking, but understanding all clocks. And if I've learned anything in those 20 years or so, that I've been teaching people about clocks and how to understand them, it's been that a certain way, a certain manner of understanding count wheel striking in American clocks is the most important thing that I can teach and pass on for an understanding of all clocks. And to explain it in a somewhat different way, I think you'll see as I go along, this is a little different way of looking at uh, count wheel striking mechanisms. You'll recognize that, I think, very quickly after we get into it. Okay, uh, let me show you what, uh, what the count wheel train, the count wheel mechanism looks like in clocks. It consists of, in every clock that you'll ever see, every, every clock that you'll ever see, consi consists of a self-contained source of power, either a spring or a weight, and a train of wheels. Last, but it doesn't end, of course, <laughs> in an escape wheel. The train of wheels ends in a air brake, a fan. Its purpose is to slow down the train when the train is running so that you get a, a regular measured beat, something that you expect to, to, to hear, that it doesn't run too fast. And in addition to that, the train, the train of wheels, remember the train of wheels as you go up, the wheels turn faster and faster. But in and amongst that train, there are three sub-assemblies, always, neither more nor less. One of them, one of them makes the noise, the hammer assembly. We'll take that up individually when we get to that movable sketch. The next one locks the train, and when the train is unlocked, the mechanism determines how long it shall run, and thereby the number of strikes that take place. That's universal, isn't it? In every, every striking mechanism you can imagine. Yes, in every one that I can imagine, that's universal, except in that clock. That clock's totally, completely different. Okay, so this, as I say, the second component locks the train when it's unlocked, determines how long the train shall run, and thereby the number of strikes that take place, but not in that clock. The third component of every striking mechanism consists of its function, what it does, it receives the initiating signal for striking, and that initiating signal, of course, 
comes from the minute hand. The minute hand uh, uh, points to the striking train and says, OK, go ahead and do the striking. That's where your initiating signal comes from. And that third component receives the initiating signal, passes it on to unlock the train, and performs that, uh, that seemingly complicated two-step process called the warning. Now you see that, in, 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 as I said, uh, you see that in practically every clock, except very few. And you won't see it in there because that clock doesn't have a warning. Matter of fact, I, I don't know if I mentioned, there are clocks which must not have a warning, which are not allowed to have a warning, if they are to function as designed, like that clock. We'll get into that a little bit later. But those are the three components that that, and that's the way I will look at every count wheel striking mechanism, and that's the way I will show you how to locate these parts, even if you've never seen, if, if you've never seen that clock before. Okay. Now, we can get to this movable sketch over here, and I will, uh, I will show you how it works. The two, two things that I want you to keep in mind, I said I was doing this to, so to carry over two things for you to look out for in count wheel striking. And it's, uh, it's this. One of them, as I said, as you go up the train, the wheels turn faster and faster, but with less turning force. And the other thing is that the initiating signal that comes from the minute hand comes from a very, very slow moving device. It takes a full hour for the minute hand to rotate. Those two points we'll carry over to this movable sketch. I'm not in the way with this. Okay. Okay. And here is, you can see it over here, or some of it that you not be able to see too well from there, you'll see on here, or in the handouts that you have. These, the first thing you'll notice in this uh, movable sketch of the striking mechanism, count wheel striking mechanism, I haven't put in all the wheels on the train. Because if I did, you wouldn't understand, you wouldn't see a thing. I've only got those parts that are directly and intimately concerned with the count wheel striking mechanism. And this, as you see, obviously, is the minute hand. And it's on an arbor. And on that arbor, in its simplest form, let, let me keep in mind with this, that this is first count wheel striking in its simplest form. It's going to get a little more complicated as we get a, go along and I make changes and, and add parts to it and so forth. And by the way, you'll never see one that looks like this. I sort of made it up and spread things apart so perhaps it's, more, it's easier to understand. But I can assure you that every one that you ever see will function like this when I get to the, uh, the Compl not the complications, the variations, that the, the principal variations that occur in count wheel striking. OK, as I told you, this is the center arbor. And on that center arbor is usually, in its simplest form, a, a bent wire that sort of looks like a bent finger or so. Or it has, does that way, it looks that way to me. And in fact, I'm going to call that little bent wire the finger on the center arbor. Uh, see, there's the finger on the center arbor. OK, that's where the initiating signal comes from. And if you ever see anything that is other than a simple little bent wire, you will understand that that something else, uh, some kind of a cam or, or whatever, if it's anything other than that simple thing, it has been devised in order that if you turn the hands backwards, you won't do any damage. Because if it's just a plain little bent wire like that, and if you turn it backwards, you see it's going to catch in this wire over here and bust something. But anything that looks different is there so that you can turn the hands back, backwards without doing any damage. Of the, now here we have the, the three components. Let's take them up one at a time. First one is the hammer assembly. That's the one that makes a noise. And in its simplest form, consists of an arbor, and two arms coming from of it. One of them's got a lump at the end. You lift it and drop, let it drop, and it makes a noise. That's the hammer. That's not ordinarily the way it's done. The other arm that comes from it, which I'll call the hammer tail, is usually lifted and dropped by one of the pins 
on a wheel low in the train. You see these pins uh, that project axially from the band of the wheel, and there may be as many as, uh, as t 12 pins or so ordinarily. And, uh, or there may be as few as two pins. Well, what's the difference? If the hammer pin wheel, obviously that's the name that I give this, if the hammer pin wheel is low in the train, moving very slowly, you will need a lot of pins, as many as 12 on there moving slowly, to allow striking to take place at a certain regular beat like that. If the man who designed the clock wants the hammer pin wheel to up, be up near the top of the train, well, all he needs are two pins. They're moving faster, but they will produce striking at about the same rate. Or if he wants to put the hammer pin wheel in, anywhere in between there, there might be six or eight pins. There's nothing different about the number of pins on the hammer pin wheel. Always works the same way as the train is running, and for the length of tra time that it's running, it lifts the hammer, lets the hammer drop to strike the gun. As a matter of fact, sometimes, oh, I'm glad I remember this, Sometimes uh, the hammer tail is not lifted, not even lifted by a hammer pinwheel, but by a star-shaped cam in the train. Uh, if, when I speak about the setup, if I forget, and I sometimes do, remind me to mention to you about the presence of a cam that lifts and drops the hammer tail in some clocks, it is sometimes very important and helpful if it's present. But uh, Again, as far as the hammer is concerned, always, 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 there are two other things associated with the hammer assembly. Always, in every clock. No exceptions, really, that I know of. <laughs> okay. And one of them is a return spring. You see, so that when the hammer tail is lifted, it's lifted against that return spring. And when it's released, it comes down with a little bit more force. And the other is, again, in every striking mechanism, some means of banking the hammer. I've used a, a pin over here, and I've got a pin on there which you probably can't see from where you are, but that pin prevents the hammer from quite reaching the gong, but the flexibility of the arm and the fact that it's coming down under uh, the, the return spring pressure causes this to flex, strike the gong, and move away. Otherwise, if it doesn't do that, you're just going to get a clunk. You won't get a clear sign. So there always, always, always must be some means of banking the hammer. OK, that's, it. that's that component in its simplest form. Next, this assembly, which I said locks the train and determines how long it shall run and so forth and so on. In its simplest form, it consists of an arbor with two arms from it. Those arms have hooks. They're hook-shaped at the end, both of them. And I'm going to call them hooks. And uh, this is the locking and counting assembly, or counting and locking assembly. One of them, one of those hooks, works in conjunction with a disc or a cam firmly fixed on one of the arbors of the train. And you can see that when that hook is in this, a slot that is present on that locking cam, the locking hook prevents the cam from rotating keeps the, keeps the train from running. The minute you lift it, the train will run. This thing will make a full circle in this case. The locking cam hook will drop into the slot and relock the train. In the time that it takes to make that one revolution, the gearing is such that one strike takes place. Sometimes, very often as a matter of fact, instead of one slot in the locking, in the locking cam, there may be two slots. Same thing happens, no difference. In the time that it runs from one until it can drop and lock in the next slot, one strike takes place. And, and not too often, I brought one along because I think it's quite unusual, American count wheel clock with three slots in the locking cam. I never saw four slots in the locking cam until a few years ago, but that was on one of those 31-day Korean movements that I'm afraid to work on anyway because of those powerful springs. Otherwise, one, two, or three slots is ordinarily what you might see on the locking cam, and I've explained how that works. It works in conjunction with the second arm on, from that arbor. Always, 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 the other arm from that arbor works with 
the part that gives this uh, mechanism its name, with the count wheel. The counting and locking always go together and come from the same orbit. You'll probably hear, hear me say that too many times in the next few minutes. And the count wheel, in its simplest form, pay no attention to this side, only this side over here. The count wheel, in its simplest form, as you can see, is a disk firmly fixed on one of the orbits of the train, and it's got deep slots in it, and it has a smooth edge on that count wheel in its simplest form. And let's take a look at the way these two things work together, because this is really the, the, the heart of it. This is the way all count wheel striking mechanisms work, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's in striking or, or in the uh, chiming, tra tra uh, in, in chiming mechanisms. They always work this way. Very simple. As I said, the minute you lift up the locking cam hook, the locking cam will start to run. And in the time that it takes to make a revolution to the, or to the next deep slot, one strike will take place. In that time, of course, the count wheel may have moved so far, no further, because it's lower in the train. You must imagine that all these things move every time I move one. I can't move them simultaneously, but I'll try to move them in some sort of sequence. Okay, so as this makes a rotation, one strike takes place, the count wheel being lower in the train has only moved so far. This thing continues to rotate. We expect this to drop back into the cam, but it doesn't drop back into the cam. Why? Because now the count wheel hook is riding on the smooth rim of the count wheel, preventing locking from taking place. All right? Function. What is the function of the part? Uh, it, it's very important to understand the function of the parts in, in, just not in, in every part of the clock. Not that it's an intellectual exercise, believe me, but if something isn't working, you know who to blame, you know where to go to make a correction. So it's important to understand the functions. Locking cam, so far, so far, has one function, to lock the train. Count wheel, it's got two functions. Can you see the, the two different functions in the count wheel? It determines how long the train shall run by the difference between, this, between the deep, deep sluts. It determines how long it shall run. And the second function is it prevents locking from taking place until the completion of the proper number of strikes. Because to complete what I started here, as when you lift this up and let it run, this rotates, one strike takes place, this moves only part of the way, you, it won't lock, it'll continue to run because this is preventing, now the count wheel is preventing locking from taking place, so this makes another strike takes place, and this moves a little bit further, and it continues to move, you see, it continues to move until the next deep slot comes underneath the count wheel hook, and then on the next rotation of the locking cam, as this comes around, locking cam hook can drop into the locking cam because the count wheel hook drops into one of those deep slots and allows it to come down that far. That, in essence, is the center of, the, of, of what takes place in every count wheel striking mechanism, even if it happens to be in count wheel chiming mechanisms. Try it sometime, you'll see. Well, a little bit further. Okay. Now, uh, that's what happens with the locking, counting, locking assembly. That's how that works. Let's take up the third assembly. The third assembly, as I said, is one that receives the initiating signal from the position of the minute hand, passes it on to unlock the train, and performs that, uh, you know, the warning, that uh, seemingly mis mysterious or complicated two-step. It isn't complicated and isn't mysterious. It's the warning. Let me show you what the third assembly consists of, again, in its simplest form. It consists of an arbor and three arms. Two of them, what, of, of two of them that receive the initiating signal and pass it on, one of them is a long one and the other one's a short one. So I'm, 
I, in an effort to make things as complicated as possible, the long one I will call the long unlocking arm and the short one I'll call the short unlocking arm. Actually, I will try as much as possible always to use a term for these parts which refers to what they actually do. They are involved with...